Thanks to all of you. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I uh, wanna share with you uh, today uh, one of the lessons on happiness uh, from my new book, which is uh, shown at the bottom of the uh, title screen here. Uh, we're gonna talk about happiness, the relation between happiness and income, both in the short run and the long run. Most importantly of all, how you explain the difference between the two. Next slide, Jill. So uh, here you can see uh, the uh, a sketch uh, of the short and long run happiness income relations relationships. Uh, the solid line represents the actual course of income uh, and of happiness over time. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the peaks indicated by a little p and the troughs indicated by a little t uh, are synchronous uh, in the short run. However, uh, if we fit a trend line to income on the one hand and happiness on the other, you will see the trend in happiness does not concur with the trend in income. So in the short run, click please. Uh, Jill, uh, as, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, in the short run, happiness and income uh, are positively related, but in the long run, shown by the broken lines, the, the trend relationship, there is a nil relationship. And it's that difference that we're interested in explaining. Next slide. It's important to be aware of the difference between the short and long run. I've put on the screen uh, a quotation from a book by Diane Coyle, a well-respected economist, British economist, uh, that uh, uh, shows uh, uh, the contradiction that can occur if people confuse uh, the short and the long run. Uh, click, please. Uh, as you'll see at the beginning of our statement, uh, she's talking about uh, rising GDP does not increase happiness. And she said, that's a silly notion. That being the long run notion, uh, click please, uh, because a recession uh, makes people very unhappy. That's the short run relationship. So basically she's confusing the two. She's saying the short run uh, relationship is evident that the long run relationship is wrong. Whereas they are two entirely different things and she doesn't realize that. Next slide. And next slide. So uh, what we're going to do is first look at happiness and income in the long run, uh, what the evidence is, and then how you explain that evidence. <clears throat> uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, the big explanatory factor for the long run is keeping up with the Joneses. Next slide. But let's start with the evidence first of the nil long run relationship. We'll go back to figure one, uh, where we have 
the short-term fluctuations and long-term trends in happiness and income. Click, please. Uh, and now let's focus on the, the broken line trend for income and happiness. Uh, and let's assume we have pictures like this for multiple countries. So we have multiple estimates of the broken line trends for income and happiness. Click. Uh, so what we want to know is if we compare countries with regard to these broken line trends, do we find that sharper uptrends in income are accompanied by greater increases in happiness? So that's the evidence we're going to look at to see what we find about the long run relationship. Yep. Next slide. Click, please. Click. And the finding uh, is no, uh, there is no significant relationship between the trends, a greater sharper increase in income is not accompanied by a greater growth in happiness. The most recent evidence of that is in an article with, that I did with Kelsey O'Connor that's in the Handbook of Labor. Uh, and, uh, 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 and the underlying data is of two types. First, we take uh, data for the World Values Survey and the e European Values Survey, 54 countries over the period 1981 onward. Uh, the other evidence is from the Gallup World, World Poll, which only starts in 2005. We have only 14 years coverage there, but uh, we have 123 countries. And we find in both cases, uh, no significant relation between the trend in income and the trend in happiness. Next slide. So some, uh, some economists seem to think that the nil relationship is confined to developed countries, that it only clicks in after a fairly high level of development is reached. I want to make clear the evidence we, that, that I just referred to includes less developed countries in the, in the Gallup World Poll. It's a very, very large number of less developed countries. Uh, and secondly, uh, as a, a, an additional evidence of the nil relationship in less developed countries, let me present uh, the trend uh, in three countries that were very poor at the start, uh, <clears throat> China, Japan, and India, and subsequently experienced very rapid economic growth uh, on the order of about a fourfold multiplication of GDP per capita. So we would think if there's any case in which economic growth was raising happiness, uh, these countries would be very substantial evidence. Put, next slide, please. So here's the picture from China for 1990 to 2012 uh, with income quadrupling. You can see happiness actually falls for about 10 to 12 years and then picks up slightly, but no improvement over the entire period in which income doubled and then doubled again. Next slide. Here's Japan in the period when it had extremely rapid economic growth from 1958 to 1987. Uh, as you can see, the trend in life satisfaction over that period is essentially nil. <clears throat> Next slide. And more recently, here's India for the period 
2006 to 2018, when we have uh, reasonable data on life satisfaction, you can see even though GDP per capita was multiplying enormously, uh, the trend in happiness, if anything, was downward. So the evidence is both in developed and in less developed countries, the long-term relationship between income and happiness is nil. Next slide. Well, then how do we explain the nil long-run relationship? And the key to the explanation is uh, given uh, by an article, in an article by Amos Tversky, shown on the left of that pretty picture, and Danny Kahneman, shown on the right, in a QJE article in 1991, which, where their basic point is, when people evaluate a particular situation, they tend to have an internal benchmark in terms of which they evaluate it. So as an example, take a man five foot nine inches tall. Is he a five, five, I'm sorry, five feet nine inches in height, okay? 175 centimeters. Uh, so is this man considered tall? In America, the average height of men is five feet, 10 inches. And uh, most Americans would be using as their internal benchmark, the height of the people that they're familiar with. And they would consider that man not to be tall. On the other hand, if you go to India, where the average height of men is five feet, six inches, they would consider a man five feet, nine inches to be tall because their internal benchmark is based on the height of others in India uh, and that they are an average substantially shorter uh, than five feet, nine inches. So uh, the point is for people in each country, the internal benchmark is the height of others in the country. So when they're judging the height of a person, their internal benchmark on the basis of which they're making that judgment is their experience with others in their own country. Next slide. So now, uh, as a way of getting at the benchmark to evaluate income, let me do a thought experiment. Uh, and note first that in what follows the uh, options, income is always constant $2,021. So the thought experiment is this to start with. Imagine you're just about to graduate and uh, considering uh, options uh, uh, A and B below, which would you prefer, A or B? earning 100,000 on graduation or 50,000 on graduation. And I think everybody would quickly opt for option A, 100,000. Next slide. But suppose the options that you were presented with instead were these. You earn 100,000 on graduation when everybody else earns $200,000. Or you earn 50,000 on graduation when everybody else earns 25,000. Which would you prefer now, option A or option B? And I can tell you uh, that standard uh, uh, effect of putting in what others are earning uh, is to alter totally the result. About two thirds of people who opted for A in the beginning now opt for B, where they're earning twice as much as anybody else, even though they're earning $50,000, whereas in option A, they would earn twice as much, 100,000. 100, 
Next slide. So the lesson is the benchmark that we use in evaluating the income of a person is the income of others. Just as a benchmark used to evaluate an individual's height is the height of others. And as for income is concerned, the lesson is happiness tends to vary directly with your own income, but inversely with others' incomes. Next slide. So we apply that then to explaining the nil long run relationship. And the explanation is when income trends upward, your happiness tends to increase because your own income is greater. But in economic growth, incomes in general are also rising. So that means the incomes of others are rising on average about the same as your own income. And the rise in your internal benchmark tends to reduce your happiness. So the net outcome is when economic growth occurs and income trends upward, your happiness increases zero. The increase, positive increase in your own income the positive effect of an increase in your own income on happiness being counterbalanced by the negative impact on happiness of the increase in everybody else's incomes. Next slide. And next slide. So now we're ready to go to the short one and explain happiness and income relationship in the short run. Next slide. And the key now uh, to explaining the relationship uh, is keeping up with the car payments. Next slide. So we go back to figure one, just as to, to recall, and we are interested now in explaining not the broken line trends, which we just did, but the, the, the uh, 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 simultaneous fluctuations in income and happiness, the solid lines. Next slide. So let's ask first whether the explanation we just had for the long run where others income uh, as the benchmark is the clue to explaining uh, the long run relationship Will that explain the short run relationship? And the answer is no. In a recession, uh, when your income goes down, everybody else's income is going down. So the decline in happiness due to the decrease in your own income is offset by the decrease in others' income. So if others' incomes were the relevant benchmark that people were using in the short run, uh, <clears throat> happiness would not decline in a recession. But as we know, it does. So how do we explain the observed short run relationship since we cannot use the same explanation that we use for the long run relationship? Next slide. So the answer is, it's because of the asymmetric response of happiness to a decrease in income as compared with an increase in income. Click. Uh, the evidence of that is uh, uh, in a recent article uh, by Deneb uh, and several others, uh, they find based on analysis uh, of three different uh, uh, data sets uh, that measures of subjective well-being are about twice as sensitive to negative as compared to positive economic growth. 
that is to income change. Those of you who know the earlier article by, again, two of uh, the major psychologists in this area, Kahneman and Tversky, unfortunately, Tversky is now deceased. Uh, they found, uh, based on uh, comparing people's responses in uh, a uh, experiment uh, that uh, people were likely to have uh, for a given change in income, uh, twice as large a negative reaction to that given change in income as to a positive change in income. Very much the same sort of result uh, that the Nevada has found in uh, time series. Next slide, please. So now we come to the basic issue because we have uh, uh, a greater uh, response to negative changes in income than positive. And the question is, why is this? Why, is, why do we get this asymmetric response? And the answer is the best benchmark that people use in evaluating uh, a decline in income shifts from others' income, what's being used in the case of an increase in income, to one's own <clears throat> personal best income, a fixed amount, one's previous previous peak. So as income increasingly falls below the previous peak, happiness progressively declines. And as income recovers, happiness tends to improve. Next slide. So then the question is, well, why would this benchmark that people are using to evaluate their income change uh, between uh, the long run and the short run situation? And the answer is it's forced on people uh, by the growing pressure of uh, fixed financial debt obligations. So as income continues to decline, to decline the pressures of these financial obligations increasingly worsen. Uh, payments on mortgages uh, uh, or lease agreements, uh, pay payments on purchases of assets like automobiles and other big ticket items, uh, uh, credit card debt, student loans, utility bills, insurance, taxes, and the like. So. When income goes below uh, its previous peak, the pressures of meeting these payments uh, start to mount on people. Next slide. And multiple studies have found a negative effect on people's happiness of debt, of debt payments and financial difficulties. And the first item is a slide, is a <clears throat> article from Norway. The second one about the United States. The third, Iceland. The fourth, Australia. And the fifth, China. <clears throat> Next slide. So what happens to keeping up with the Joneses? The answer is, in the short run, keeping up with the Joneses is replaced by keeping up with the car payments. Individuals are forced to focus on their increasingly difficult financial situation. The fact that the Joneses are in the same boat and facing the same problem doesn't help you meet the payment due on your own financial obligations. So keeping up with the Joneses goes by the board it's now a matter of keeping up with the car payments. Next slide. How pervasive is the burden of debt problem? Well, 
as one example. In 2014, 80% of, of Americans were in debt and the median amount owed was almost $68,000. Next slide. So the outcome for happiness income in the, in the short run is that in a recession, happiness goes down and up as income uh, falls below its previous peak and then recovers. And this is due largely to an increasing and then decreasing problem of meeting one's financial obligations, the varying pressure of keeping up with the car payments. Next slide. So the conclusion about happiness and income in the short and long run about explaining them is that in the short run, happiness varies directly with income. In the long run, a nil relationship. Why? Because there's an asymmetric relation in the benchmarks used to evaluate income change in the short run and long run. When income falls below its previous peak, the benchmark is keeping up with the car payments. When income trends upward beyond its previous peak, it's keeping up with the Joneses, the long run relationship. <clears throat> Next slide. So in conclusion, let me touch briefly on the policy implications uh, of uh, this analysis. If the goal is to raise happiness, economic growth will not do it. Over the long run, economic growth has a nil relationship, has a nil impact on happiness. Notice that in policies, that in formulating policies to promote economic growth, the entity you're thinking about is businesses and you're focusing on the needs of businesses. What can be done to increase business output and productivity? And people and households only enter indirectly in, in the sense that they are managed or manipulated to meet the out of output or productivity requirements. For example, uh, by providing markets for business products or more skilled labor. Next slide. <clears throat> if you want policies that will raise happiness, you need to focus not on businesses, but on people and direct those policies toward meeting the primary needs uh, that are most important for people's happiness. Next slide. And what are these policies? Basically, there are three types. One is policies that provide economic security, assurance about jobs and adequate income. Secondly, policies that meet family needs over the life cycle, childcare, schooling, adequate housing, uh, <clears throat> uh, parental uh, leave, uh, elderly care, and third, policies that ensure lifelong uh, physical and mental health care for oneself and one's family. Next slide. So, in conclusion, the policy implications are instead of focusing on business and the growth of output. Policy should focus on people and increasing happiness. Next slide. Next slide. And thanks to all of you and Kelsey O'Connor, who was a big help here. Great. Thank you so much, Richard, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure we have many questions. We do have some time for question and answers right now. Um, if you would like to either just go ahead and type in your question or comment in the chat bar, 
and we will address those. Um, or you're welcome to also unmute yourself and ask the question. Let's start first with a question from Jose de Jesus Garcia Vega, um, who asked the question, Jose, if you're with us, would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself and, and uh, video and ask your question, please? Yes. Um, first of all, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dick. Nice Hi, to see Olga. you again. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Good. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. I just was wondering, you, you were talking about the, in the short run, uh, the effects of a decrease in income. Uh, what happens when, when the, in the short run, when the income increases, uh, are we becoming happier because we compare ourselves with the, the most recent lower income or, or uh, how does that function? Yeah, no, uh, what, uh, the, the point is uh, that uh, people don't use the previous peak when their income is increasing. They don't look back and say, oh, I'm happier because I've got more than I used to have. They're looking at what is happening to others. That was the point of the thought experiment, you see, to show how pe when, when everybody's income is changing, not just your own, but others as well, uh, you tend uh, to think about what's the other, what the others are getting in evaluating your income. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Good our to next talk question. to you, Jose. Thank you, Jose. Our, our, that's okay. Our next question comes from Carol Graham. Carol. So hi, Dick. Thank well, hi, thanks, Carol. Joe. Obviously, hey, Dick. Great to see you and for the wonderful presentation. Nice um, to see you. Yeah, always. Um, so I have a, I have a, uh, a, a comment and then a devil's advocate question. So the comment is a really, a, you know, obviously I, I think the whole book venture is great. I'm waiting for my copy, as you know, but, um, and the short and long run, you know, differentials, which people fail to do is, is also really important. Um, so thank you for you know, really bringing those into the debate on this topic. And the other thing is I've been, you probably know, I've been working a lot on despair and this sort of indebtedness, keeping up with payments among low-income Americans is huge. Um, and I think it's obviously dragging down life satisfaction levels at the low end of the scale more than anywhere else. But then, come, then comes my, uh, my devil's advocate question, which is, have you looked at inequality in the nature of growth? You know, in the past, you've talked about the pattern and nature of growth, but a lot of, so if you think about the US, it's it's very unequal, not just in income, but in terms of well-being. And then if you look at the developing countries that you highlighted, not only are they, um, did growth come accompanied with a lot of new inequality, maybe not Japan, but certainly India and China, which, which really had the big plunges in life satisfaction during growth, but also with a lot more instability and disruption of existing social systems. And I mean, is there a distinction in your aggregate graphs between countries that have more stable and equitable growth over time, if maybe not rapid growth, and the, and the countries that grow often the most, but have very volatile growth and a lot of inequality um, accompanying it. Yeah, uh, uh, I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's hard to uh, uh, give a simple answer. Uh, if you take China, okay, uh, with uh, enormous growth, uh, happiness uh, actually is declining uh, when GDP per capita is rising rapidly. And it's declining uh, because uh, the Chinese choose a policy that focuses on business output at the expense of uh, the employment of persons. And so you have output uh, rising rapidly uh, at the same time, 
uh, that employment is declining. And of course, the people that suffer the most are uh, the more, more vulnerable members of the population. So you see relatively little change in the happiness of the uh, most educated people uh, and a big decline in the happiness of the less educated people who prior to that were uh, under socialism almost as happy uh, as the better educated people. So there's a situation where you have growth with uh, out regard to the uh, inequality situation. Uh, but obviously you can have uh, other cases in which uh, there's more participation. But in, in, in every case, what's tending to happen if it's just income going up is people are comparing themselves with others. So in my book, uh, I have quotations. Uh, for example, in India, uh, how uh, the, the weddings need to be uh, held in places where you need a helicopter to get there. Uh, you the, in China, it's uh, how uh, golf courses and uh, uh, polo, whatever it is, uh, are all becoming in things. So the tendency in all of these countries, less and more developed, is to look at what's happening uh, to the lifestyles uh, of uh, the upper income people as time goes along, keeping up with the Joneses. I don't know whether that answers your question, but it's the uh, best I can do. I mean, it's a complicated question. It, uh, it certainly, it goes a long way. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Our, our next question comes from David Myers. David, are you with us? If you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Uh, yes. Uh, and I should put myself in the video. So I've long admired your work and make good use of it. And it's great to hear you and see you. And thank you very much. Yeah, nice to see you, David. Um, I'm intrigued by the difference in how we represent income in income happiness correlations. When psychologists look at this, we use real world income, linear income on the X axis and maybe plot life satisfaction or happiness on the Y axis as you do in your uh, chapter where you present, present gross domestic product, for example, on the, on the X axis. But economists often use log income. And by using log income, they can take a curvilinear relationship and straighten it into a linear relationship between increasing income and happiness. And I'm wondering if you could just educate me as to the distinction between linear and log income and why economists seem to prefer log income rather than real income. Uh, so the log income uh, is better, better thought of simply as the percent, looking at the percentage change in income. So the psychologist's approach would say, uh, uh, let's see what happens to happiness if income goes up by $10,000 and continue to increase the amount of income by $10,000, looking at what happens to happiness. So they have a horizontal scale that's in absolute terms. When you put a, a, approach it in terms of log income, then the happiness, that, then the income scale is in terms of percentage changes. So you're saying, what happens to happiness when income goes up by 10% uh, or uh, 20% rather than what happens to what happens to happiness when it goes up by an absolute amount. And the difference, as you're well aware, is that the effect on happiness of percentage changes in income is constant. 
whereas the effect on happiness of absolute changes in income is progressively decreasing increases in happiness. So that's the, the reason, that's the, the what, what, why we look at the percentage changes. So uh, to, to explain the, what the rationale for the percentage changes, suppose you were to say, uh, I want to get an equal impact uh, on happiness, an equal negative income, uh, equal negative impact on happiness, uh, reducing income for a person whose income is uh, $100,000 versus an income whose person, the person a person whose income is $10,000, okay? You wanna reduce their happiness equally by taking money away. Now, if you take uh, $1,000 away from the, thousand, from the top guy, he's not gonna have much effect on happiness because his income is $100,000. If you take it away from the guy with only $10,000 in income, it's gonna affect him adversely, okay? So you say, how do I make the impact of taking in income away equal? And the answer is by doing what? Taking the same percentage away from each of them, not the same amount away from each of them. And that's why economists look at percentage changes because they expect percentage changes to have equivalent effects on happiness at all levels of income. Help that help. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. If I could just add to that, I think when economists make the point that there's a linear direct correlation between income and happiness, and they're showing us log income, that distinction sometimes gets lost on the general public, which thinks in terms of real dollars in their pocket. Yeah, right. The, We'd have to educate the general public the same way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next question comes from, and I'm, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing this correctly, Esan Latif, are you with us? If you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Richard, for very informative presentation. So I have a question that uh, for suppose for developing countries, they have a very low uh, income and they have many people cannot add uh, basic needs. On the other hand, uh, developed countries, at least the people have met basic needs. Now, if in economic growth, then the developing countries people, they their income increase, healthcare system improves, and they have they should increase their uh, happiness. I believe that happiness increase their case compared to uh, developed countries. So, what is your thinking that whether the economic growth has a nil effect, no effect? But I think that developing countries should have some impact on happiness. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, my answer is uh, the, the same mechanisms that undermine the impact of increased income on happiness work in both developed and less developed countries. And the evidence that I presented in the talk was, if you look at what happened in uh, three really initially quite poor countries, China, India, and Japan, uh, there's no improvement in happiness, uh, even though they have uh, multiple uh, growth in income. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Our next question, uh, again, apologies if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Yanni Petri, are you with us? Yeah, Hello. I'm with you. That was pretty good. <laughs> so it's Jani Petri Laamonen from Finland. Hello, everyone. Uh, so first of all, I, I want to thank Richard Easterlin for, for the talk, of course, and, and for uh, inspiring uh, most of my current research. 
and also uh, also my uh, my uh, graduate students' research nowadays. So so thank you. Anyway, uh, I then wanted to ask you something related to a recent paper by us. Uh, we show that uh, the asymmetric effects of uh, economic increases and decreases uh, they last long, in the sense that uh, in the sense that uh, the or they become stronger over time because uh, because the effects of economic growth goes away and uh, in the long run, but uh, the big effects of uh, of contractions they stay and and uh, and remain in the long run. So uh, I've been a little bit puzzled about what what could cause these uh, long run effects of of contractions. I mean, you talked about benchmark, and uh, and one possibility, of course, is that uh, the benchmark. Kind of diverges from from the actual actual national average income, but that doesn't sound very plausible to me. Then uh, now I uh, first time I heard heard from you about uh, about payments, and that makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, and maybe it's could it be that the uh, the pay payment burden uh, is not eased even when when economy is uh, recovering after a crisis for example or after a contraction so what, what's your take on 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 what could cause these long run effects of uh, contractions uh, i'm 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 sorry uh, that uh, i'm not following uh, particularly uh, the evidence uh, that you are asking me to explain uh, so uh, in, in uh, the Denev uh, paper that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, they're showing uh, how uh, the, uh, uh, you, you get a, a, a short-term contraction with a lot of impact on happiness compared to a, a long, longer-term expansion with a much less impact on happiness and a nil relationship between the two. Now, I don't know whether that bears on your question or not. Yeah, I, uh, uh, we, show, we show that the, uh, the large effects of contractions, uh, they are long lived. So, so I wonder how that fit, kind of fits the benchmark what you, theory. What, I'm sorry. What do you mean by long lived? Long lived means that because uh, uh, Deneva and others so that uh, there are short run asymmetries in the effects of uh, economic changes. What we show is that this uh, this stream asymmetry uh, is there also in the long run. So. Uh, basically, the essence of that result is that uh, when there's a downturn, there's a big effect, as you said. But that effect doesn't go away. So uh, recessions kind of leave a scar or something. So I wonder where that scar might come from. In the, uh, yeah, especially well, in your uh, uh, theoretical. <laughs> Uh, okay, that's that's the first uh, I've I've heard about the the scarring effects of of happiness declines. So that's it, good information. I'll have to uh, ponder it some more. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. Um, um, our next question, moving forward, is from Annie Kubadaji, I believe is how you pronounce it. Are, are you with us, Annie? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Almost there. Um, my name is Annie Anitubaji, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I um, appreciate it for the synthesis, and I'm actually uh, impressed by the fact that it seems to make a lot of convergence between many things. Uh, many things that in the past have been uh, more um, antagonized 
<laughs> or maybe I'm over interpreting what, what you presented. But in your um, in your analysis, you're using measures uh, for uh, life satisfaction, for happiness. And these are things that people self-report, right? And then your implications uh, were all related with objective conditions of their life. And also uh, using a lot from um, Kahneman and Fersky in the explanation of the mechanisms, uh, this, this sounds to me like a claim that uh, there is no, um, no good reason to distinguish subjective and objective happiness, but rather to think of uh, subjective happiness as a proxy for the real happiness. And the real happiness is really based on the objective uh, characteristics, but just uh, there are some more complex mechanisms behind that have to be understood and some biases, cognitive biases, which are at stake, like the ones from Kahneman and Fersky, that explain the relationship between the objective and the subjective one. So it is not like um, Bhutan uh, can be happy in its own way because of its culture, and uh, we have a different kind of culture in the uh, West, and um, our subjective um, benchmarks and so on so are different. But there is something like a universal mechanism to make people happy. Uh, so uh, I think you want to look at my book because uh, I draw heavily uh, on the uh, uh, now a half century old research of Hadley Cantrell, where he surveyed people uh, in 14 countries rich and poor, communist and non-communist uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, he asked them an open-ended question about uh, what would be the best of all possible worlds. And then a similar question, what would be the worst of all possible worlds? So you can compare the responses uh, in countries uh, of extremely different cultures. And when you do that, you find there's an enormous similarity. And the things that are most important for people's happiness, the best of all possible worlds, are things having to do with the three items I mentioned uh, at the end of the talk, economic security, family circumstances, and health. Now, when you think about it, that was not a big surprise because people, irrespective of culture, everywhere in the world are spending most of their time trying to make a living, taking care of a family and worrying about health. So even though you may think there are big differences in what happiness means to people around the world, when you ask an open-ended question, exploring that issue, you get very similar responses. And I think you get very similar responses for the very good reason that people's lives are much the same. Most people's lives are much the same everywhere in the world. They're spending their time on the same types of concerns. Thank you for the question. Thank you and thank you for the reference. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Anke. Yes, hello. Hi, Dick. Nice Hi, to see you. <laughs> As you know, Good I'm always here. <laughs> so thank you for citing my study in your presentation. Yes. <laughs> so my question would be... <laughs> I would have added this is the best of them all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I obviously completely agree with your policy recommendations. They need to be focused on family health and so on. My question is, in your personal opinion, do you think there are any countries that are actually doing well with this? That you would say, oh, we should follow this country or do you think um, that doesn't really exist right now that no country is doing very well in terms of focusing on people instead of just GDP because I think we definitely see a trend that more governments are talking about measuring well-being and focusing on well-being do you think any countries are actually doing it personal oh, opinion yeah. or what do you think no I think it's very clear the 
uh, Nordic countries uh, with their focus on the welfare states are doing it and they're the happiest countries in the world. Uh, you, you give me an opportunity to refer again to my book and uh, <laughs> the, I spend uh, some time on what government policies will increase happiness. And I make the point uh, that uh, the, the Nor Nordic social democracies are really uh, far and away in the lead. Uh, and uh, uh, a, a few, you don't have to be rich to, to be there. So Costa Rica. What about New uh, Zealand Dick, in, on your yeah. list? How about New Zealand? Uh, oh, New Zealand, yeah. New Zealand and, and Australia are among the top 10. No, I'm not saying the Nordic countries are the only ones, but the welfare states are in there. <clears throat> but uh, where was I? <laughs> uh, I forget. Anyway, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the answer to your question is, yeah. So there, there are, uh, oh, Costa Rica has an income of one fourth of the United States and it's happier. Why is it happier? It started developing welfare state policies back in the 1950s and even to some extent before that. Thanks Anka for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question at Shu Yang, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hi, I'm Hi. Shu Yang. Yeah, I'm very glad to meet you in this webinar because I was actually inspired by your work to research into happiness. I'm, I'm still an early researcher. And hi, Joe. <laughs> mm. yeah, my, my question is about um, the measurement. Since, as you have mentioned, and um, Chinese people actually focus on the GDP, right? I'm, I'm, I'm from China, uh, but there are actually Lots of changes happening in China. And also the president Xi Jinping has been focusing on um, the happiness of people and the well-being of people. Our country is actually trying to emphasize on happiness. Um, so what I'm wondering is um, what is the proper measurement of happiness? Since there is no universally acknowledged measure for happiness, right? And also, um, I do agree with you that um, other aspects of people should be focused on. And that's why I'm researching into leisure and happiness. So I'm wondering what, in your opinion, is most needed, needed by the people and should be promoted? So these two uh, questions, thank you. So uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the, the measures of happiness uh, that I focus on uh, are the evaluative measures uh, where people are essentially asked to uh, sit back and evaluate uh, their lives as a whole. So the, the measures of life satisfaction, of happiness, are the best and worst possible worlds in general, not where you were yesterday, not experiential measures, but the evaluative measures that give you the overall picture. Uh, I think those measures uh, have been quite informative about what's happened in China uh, and should continue to uh, be used to evaluate what's happening in China. I would like to think that there was more concern uh, at the highest levels about those measures than GDP. But I think in practice, it's GDP that runs the show. Uh, and uh, we still have a long way to go uh, for uh, not just in China, but the United States as well, but in most countries throughout the world, uh, of recognizing that our focus should be on people and their happiness rather than on businesses and their production. Thanks, Yuya. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Shuyang. I hope you're, are you in China now? It's three in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you for logging in. And hopefully you get to oh. participate in this I'm webinar. Sorry to keep you up. <laughs> <laughs> Good. 
Um, are there, <laughs> good. Well, thank you so much. Are there any other questions? I have time for one more if anyone else has another question or comment. We have a lot of people saying thank you. May I? Uh, I would like to build on the question about measurement. Could I? Sure. Yes, thank you ahead. very much. Um, I would like to ask you what uh, do you think about this uh, trend of measuring uh, happiness objectively with uh, via different biomarkers, like, you know, the literature on cholesterol, uh, cortisol, I mean, sorry. And uh, in this context, I would also like to know from you what is your opinion about this variation on scales of measuring uh, life satisfaction. Thank you very much. Uh, I, would you just explain to me what measures uh, your setting up uh, as options vis-a-vis uh, -vis happiness and life satisfaction? My first part of the question was related to the uh, new trend of uh, finding new measures and called instead of being subjective measures to have objective measures. And it is the stress hormone uh, cortisol, what I'm referring mostly to in the literature. Uh, and it was my questions formulated, what is your opinion about uh, these new ways of trying to measure, uh, even though we know the plus and minus of this measurement? And uh, if uh, you could tell us your opinion, about using these measures for measuring uh, objectively. Uh, okay, I think I got it. Thank you. So uh, my own feeling is uh, just as uh, we've uh, uh, struggled along with GDP as, as a guide to our success uh, in uh, the past 50 years, uh, we should uh, focus on uh, the uh, subjective measures that I've described, happiness, life satisfaction, uh, and best and worst possible worlds uh, in the evaluative terms uh, now. I know that like New Zealand has like 30 different measures of various dimensions of people's feelings uh, and, and experiences, but how you put them together to say, well, are people doing better or worse? God knows what the answer to that question is. And I think only God knows, and I'm not sure any, even he knows. Uh, I think the focus should be on uh, the existing uh, evaluative measures of subjective well-being and not multi-item measures as psychologists often do, but single item measures uh, like happiness and life satisfaction. That's my view. Thank you. Uh, and the second part of the question was on the subjective part. Uh, if uh, you could say a few words about the length of the scale of measuring uh, the life satisfaction. You show us uh, figures uh, as OECD used to have from zero to 10. If uh, you could tell us your opinion about uh, some variation in the scale of measuring life satisfaction. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm not sure. Uh, if you look at uh, the OECD, uh, tends to distinguish uh, between three types of measures, uh, the evaluative, uh, the experiential, uh, and the eudonic. Uh, the eudaimonic. Uh, the only ones I haven't discussed are the eudaimonic. I think uh, they're not very helpful. I think the measure ought to be a measure uh, that uh, draws upon uh, people's uh, stated feelings uh, and not imposed upon people by saying, well, are you flourishing or whatever? It may be. Uh, happiness is a very simple concept that people have no trouble in talking about. 
Uh, and uh, wh when we <clears throat> ask people about their happiness, one of the benefits of the response is it's that the measure is not being determined by the uh, experts who are like myself who are outside and looking on. It's being determined, the happiness response is being determined by the individual. And I think that's a very fundamental. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle. Uh, Richard, do you have a time for one more question? Sure. Okay, one more question uh, from Mia Kumari from India. Mia, if you're with us, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question, go ahead. You're on mute, so go ahead and unmute yourself, Mia. Yeah, hello, everyone. Hi. Yes, sir, uh, I'm from India, and I just want to ask uh, uh, that uh, uh, India is rich, uh, I mean, uh, regarding spiritualism and everything, and we have also a uh, family system, but in spite of that, uh, we are performing very poorly uh, in uh, world happiness ranking. So uh, what kind of policy should we undertake or uh, what uh, should we promote GDP in our country or what kind of measures should we take? Uh, so I think uh, the answer is the one I gave uh, at the end of my talk. Uh, instead of India focusing uh, on increasing output, which it seems to have been doing quite successfully, it should be focusing on people's uh, uh, employment, uh, on their income uh, security, uh, on uh, their family circumstances and on their health. Uh, and it should be policies concerned about people, not policies concerned about businesses. Now businesses take up all the time of economics in India and in most parts of the world. <laughs> okay, thank you so thank much, you. sir. Good question. Welfare policy. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Um, with that, I think we will uh, end this webinar as we've had many questions. Uh, Dr. Easterlin, we thank you so much for the amazing presentation. Uh, we thank you for your time and for taking the time to answer all of our questions. As a reminder to everyone, as we said in the beginning, um, we will be sharing this webinar recorded session on our YouTube channel. If you're a member, you'll actually have access to that first. If you're a member, we'll also be posting all of these supplemental materials in on the discussion board. So again, another reason to become a member, uh, you can join us simply by going online and, and joining us today. Also, we invite you again, please consider joining us at our upcoming conference. Um, in August. The deadline, early bird registration deadline is June 1st. So a couple of days, become a member and then take advantage of our discount. Um, thank you so much, Richard, for the wonderful re pleasure. webinar presentation. We really appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone. And with that, we will end the meeting and uh, say goodbye. Thanks for your good work, Jill. Thanks, sir. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>